All right, so this will correlate with chapter 11 and chapter 12 in your explorations textbook. So if you haven't already, please make sure you've read chapter 11 and chapter 12. I do also, as usual, I recommend making flashcards for all bold terminology. And also I recommend um, answering those, those review questions at the end of the chapter. Those will help prepare you for the exam. All right, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we left off. We were just about to talk about the Neanderthal Genome Project. Does that sound about correct, everybody? All right, so uh, way back in the early 2000s, uh, they didn't publish a study until 2010, uh, but they extracted, they were able to successfully extract DNA from 21 different Neanderthal specimens from the Venja cave site in Croatia. And they were able to, through a very meticulous process, we'll watch a video clip here in a second, where Svante Pablo is talking about the process and some of the difficulties that they encountered. Uh, but through this meticulous process, they were able to extract DNA from Neanderthal fossils, and they were able to completely map the Neanderthal genome. So once they had done that, once they had mapped the genome, they were then able to compare it to the genomes of modern day, modern day humans. So from all different regions of the globe, all different ancestries, and they found that the Neanderthal genomes that they mapped shared far more similarities with modern day Europeans and Asians, which makes sense. Um, since Neanderthals existed in basically Eurasia, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia uh, when they were alive. And they coexisted with modern Homo sapiens, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, for at least 10,000 years. And actually, the possibility is probably that they existed together for much longer than that. Um, but we have pretty solid evidence that Homo sapiens made it to Europe by at least 40,000 years ago. And the Neanderthals were already there at that time. So they did coexist with them for at least 10,000 years. So it's always been a huge question, you know, did they interact with one another? Did they compete with one another? Did they interbreed with one another? Um, so that's been a big question in the field of paleoanthropology for, um, you know, the, the, the last many, many decades. So the Neanderthal Genome Project is very unique in the way that it essentially was able to provide um, genetic evidence that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals did in fact successfully interbreed and successfully produce viable fertile offspring. So thinking way back to our lecture at the very beginning of the semester when we talked about the species concept. So the species concept looks at, you know, essentially how do we define a biological species? And we know that when species become geographically and genetically isolated from one another for long enough, sometimes they diverge and become completely separate species that are no longer capable of interbreeding and producing viable fertile offspring. Um, but it's, it is now supported by the Neanderthal Genome Study, and of course more studies are needed. Uh, but this study does provide evidence that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens did in fact successfully interbreed and successfully produce viable fertile offspring. Because now, in modern day, 40,000 years later, we see that modern day Europeans and Asians have more similarities with Neanderthal genomes. So those of us that have European, Middle Eastern, or Western Asian ancestry generally have anywhere from about 200 to 300 Neanderthal haplotypes in our DNA. I believe I have 283. Uh, I did my, I sent my DNA into Ancestry.com and also uh, 23andMe. And, you know, of course, there's some debate about how accurate these, you know, these services are, but um, I definitely got similar results from both from both companies. And, you know, I do have European ancestry, so it makes sense that I would be on the higher end of the spectrum as far as how my DNA compares to a Neanderthal. Uh, so the data suggests that between one and four percent of the genomes of anatomically modern humans are derived from Neanderthals, meaning that they successfully interbred with them, with them um, swap DNA and produce viable fertile offspring. So this study supports at least some degree of interbreeding between anatomically modern Homo sapiens and Neanderthals living in Europe um, during that time frame where they interlapped, okay, so where they overlapped essentially. So between 40 to 30,000 years before present and possibly a bit longer, but we know that they coexisted with each other for at least a good 10,000 years. So this was a big deal because it certainly called into question whether or not we can consider 
um, Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens completely separate species, or whether we should consider them the same species, but geographical variations of one another. So, you know, the Neanderthals being very cold adapted, short, stout, muscular, um, very robust bones, um, likely engaged in dangerous hunting strategies, likely focused in on a higher degree of protein in their diet, terrestrial protein sources, um, possibly had language, but possibly not as complex as ours, and also had the capacity for symbolic expression, symbolic burial, and a lot of evidence out there that Neanderthals were not dumb or brutish at all, that they were quite intelligent and possibly just more specialized than Homo sapiens because Neanderthals were very specialized into survival in a very cold, harsh environment. So it's certainly possible that just like, you know, what, what we learned with the Australopithecines, that maybe the Neanderthals were just a little bit too specialized, whereas, you know, similar to the way that the robust Australopithecines were a bit too specialized. Obviously, they're specialized to different environments, uh, but maybe what gave Homo sapiens the advantage was possibly their variety, their variations in diet, their the variety of different environments that they were accustomed to surviving in. So, you know, what we've always talked about this whole semester in the game of evolution, diversity wins. So um, it's certainly possible that Neanderthals were not in any way less intelligent or less capable of complex symbolic behavior than Homo sapiens were, uh, but they were maybe just a little bit more specialized in their diet. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Homo sapiens. So we know that they arrived in Africa or appeared in Africa, likely originated in Africa by no later than 200,000 years before present. There is some evidence that suggests a little bit earlier than that, like possibly 300,000 years before present. There's a site in Morocco and Northern Africa that has anatomically modern Homo sapiens dating back possibly as old as 300,000 years. Uh, but definitely we know solidly by 200,000 years before present, we see the appearance of Homo sapiens in Africa. Uh, they arrived in Asia by about 100,000 years before present. They arrived in Australia by about 50,000 years before present. And sorry, I need to update this slide. They arrived in Europe by at least 40,000 years before present. And they arrived in the Americas by about 15,000 years before present. So anatomical features that we're going to see with Homo sapiens, uh, very large cranial capacity, anywhere from 1200 to 1700 cc's. A uh, very vertical forehead. So everybody feel starting at your eye, eyebrow all the way up to your hairline. Our foreheads are vertical. We don't have that long, low, sloping cranial vault like we've seen in all the other species. Um, so if you see a vertical forehead, you know you're most likely looking at an anatomically modern Homo sapiens skull. Um, very small or non-existent brow ridges. So we're not seeing that really robust double arch brow ridge like we saw in Homo erectus and Heidelbergensis and the Neanderthals, uh, we can see that there is, you know, a little bit of a brow ridge, but it's not anything significant, um, especially if you're comparing it to some of those earlier forms. So very, very slight, very delicate brow ridge. Um, the nasal aperture, so that's essentially where the, no the nose opening. So most of our nose is made up of cartilage, which doesn't, um, you know, doesn't preserve in the fossil record. So what we have left is just this aperture, this opening where the nose would have gone. Because at this point, all the all the cartilage has has decayed and is no longer um, part of those anatomical remains that we can look at. Uh, but you see, in comparison to the Neanderthal, Homo sapiens have a relatively narrow nasal aperture. We have a pronounced chin. So that's another feature that's very unique to Homo sapiens. We are the only species that have this protruding mandibular symphysis, also called mental protuberance. But it's essentially, that's a fancy way of saying protruding chin. So we have a vertical forehead and we have a protruding chin. Uh, the region in the back, the occipital region, is much more rounded than what you would see in a Neanderthal or Homo erectus or Heidelbergensis. Um, we have that rounded occipital region. And then from the neck down, the postcranial skeleton is relatively gracile. It's longer and lankier. The, the long bones aren't quite as thick as what you might see in a Neanderthal. Uh, because we are warm adapted, Homo sapiens uh, originated in Africa. So we've had the longest period of time to essentially adapt to those circumstances. So this kind of shows you, uh, this shows you a lateral view. On the right hand side, we have anatomically modern Homo sapien. And then here on the left hand side, we have C and Neanderthal. So even though um, cranial capacity is relatively similar, 
Um, on average, Neanderthal's brain was actually a little bit bigger than ours. Um, but the cranial capacity itself is very similar, but obviously the shape of the crania is quite different. The Neanderthal has kind of this football shape, and then Homo sapiens more of this kind of basketball shape, if it, you know, to, to give it a bit of an analogy. Um, but it's very possible that their brain was just slightly was organized slightly differently than ours, or that um, you know they focused in on different regions of the brain as they were adapting to survival and their environmental circumstances. So just because their brain is structured or their, their skull is structured a little bit differently than ours doesn't necessarily mean that they were, um, you know, in biological terms, doesn't mean that they weren't capable of interbreeding and producing viable fertile offspring is what we're finding. Um, so you can see the round, tall skull with the vertical forehead in Homo sapiens and the long, low, sloping skull of the Neanderthal, um, relatively small brow ridges in the Homo sapien, and then this robust double arch brow ridge in the Neanderthal. Homo sapiens have a small gracile face and uh, smaller dentition. And then also they have this presence of a chin. And then when you're looking at the postcranial, you see from the neck down, the Neanderthals are going to be very robust and Homo sapiens will be longer, lankier. All right, so behavior wise, we know that Homo sapiens hunted a wide range of basically medium sized game animals. And they also, of course, just like other species, were very omnivorous. So whenever, whenever possible, whenever available, they're also exploiting pl uh, plant and fruit vegetables or plant vegetables and, and fruits. And they're likely eating insects and likely still eating tubers. And there's evidence that they started to actually eat um, protein sources that were in the ocean. So um, shellfish and things like that. So Homo sapiens, out of all the species that we've looked at so far, have the most diverse diet. They're eating uh, medium-sized game animals, they're fishing, they're eating everything that they ate before, vegetables, fruit, tubers, insects. So this very diverse diet may have given them an advantage. Um, they also had an advanced, sophisticated tool technology called Aurignacian tool technology, and they had the capacity to... Um, they had a, basically an addle, which is a basic bow and arrow type type device. So in comparison to the Neanderthals, Homo sapiens were able to hunt the same game that Neanderthals were hunting, but they were able to back up further. So they could stand, you know, a, a few, you know, they could 40 feet back and hunt something off in the distance, for example. So they didn't um, have to be super close to very dangerous game animals. Um, and then also they had, there's evidence that Homo sapiens absolutely had deliberate burial practices and ritualistic burial practices. So within the burials of modern Homo sapiens, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, we often find a variety of symbolic objects. So carved figurines, cave paintings, et cetera, et cetera. So we sometimes associate the emergence of Homo sapiens with the emergence of um, very complex modern symbolism. So, and that's of course been debated as well, uh, because we now know that it's very likely that Neanderthals were ca very capable of the symbolic um, cave art and statuettes and figurines, um, just as much so as, as Homo sapiens living at the same time. Uh, for your discussion this week, you will watch just one episode of the First Peoples documentary. We're going to watch a little clip of it here in a second. Uh, but you will be watching, it's about 50 minutes, uh, the, whole, the it's called The First Peoples, Episode 5, Europe, and that particular documentary will give you a lot of information on the evidence that is out there that, you know, that both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were behaving in pretty complex ways. So it's, you know, kind of calling into question those old, um, you know, those old ideas that somehow, somehow, um, Neanderthals were less advanced or less capable of symbolism than Homo sapiens. But that kind of goes into um, some of our arrogant beliefs, I think. You know, early on in the field, it was just thought that, you know, it's not possible that, you know, that any species could be more complex than Homo sapiens. But, you know, as we as we discover more and more in the fossil record, we're finding that that's very possible. All right. So before I get to that clip about the Neanderthals, let's talk a little bit about some of the... Um, some of the enigmas, let's call them. So some of the, um, the the genus Homo fossils that surprised us. So this is one of the first that was very, um, you know, it's kind of the oddball out, like what, you know, paleoanthropologists, uh, you know, around the time that this particular fossil came on the scene, 
it was very um it was very debated because it's confusing it, it confused us based on what they found so the, this particular fossil was found on the island of flores um, right off the coast of indonesia so dated to as recently as 100,000 to 60,000 years before present, um, but very primitive features. So the cranial capacity, extremely small. Cranial capacity is about 380 cc's. So that's um, right around the size of Lucy's brain, way back with the Australopithecines. Um, but along with this, they were found with pretty sophisticated stone tool technology. So small brain, sophisticated tools, um, had made it out of Africa, made it all the way to Flores Island, um, and the, the biggest theory out there that's a, that has the most support is something called island dwarfism. So island dwarfism is a phenomenon where, you know, we know, not just with hominins, but with many other species, scientists have observed that if you isolate a species on an island or a group of species on an island, they will dwarf over time. And the reason for that is island environments just by chance tend to have less available resources. It's a you know smaller, more concentrated, um, isolated environment. So they tend to have less resources available um, to support the species. So the smaller the body size, the less calories you need, right? So it is in evolutionary terms, um, island dwarfism is essentially that selective factor that because we want a, lar a smaller body size, because we're living in an island environment in that circumstance, over time, evolution selects for smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller body size. So the biggest theory out there right now is that a subset of Homo erectus, perchance, got isolated on Flores Island. And over many, 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 many generations, they dwarfed over time. So they became smaller and smaller and smaller because that was beneficial for their survival. They were trying to exist on this island environment with fewer resources than the mainland. So it became advantageous for them to get smaller and smaller and smaller over time. Okay, so let's watch a little clip about this one. So this little clip is from um, the Becoming Human documentary, Becoming Human episode two. So this one we'll talk about... Um, this one will talk about the enigma of Homo floresiensis. So we're just gonna watch a little bit of this clip. So as you're watching, just think about how do they know how old these fossils are? How do they date them? And what parts of their anatomy are they focusing on? And listen to the part where they talk about island dwarfism. Two million years ago, long before Turkanaboy, scientists now accept that as soon as Homo erectus appeared on the savannas of Africa, they started to leave. Suddenly, with the origin of Homo erectus, we get this shift in body shape, and then boom, they're out of Africa right away. The Georgia fossils prove that Homo erectus left Africa much earlier than previously thought. An even more provocative find shows the migration may have started even earlier. 5,000 miles from Africa, the island of Flores, Indonesia. In 2003, researchers made a discovery so strange, nobody knew what to make of it. They found the bones of a tiny human ancestor, just over three feet tall, even smaller than the Dimenisi fossils. They called this baffling new ancestor Homo floresiensis, and because of its tiny size, nicknamed it the Hobbit. And this has created a tremendous amount of grief because we're not really sure of what we're seeing here. Uh, the size of the Hobbit brain endocast is roughly 400 cc's. That's barely bigger than the brain of Lucy the famous bipedal ape from three million years ago. It's not just a small brain and a primitive looking face, but the foot's primitive, the hand's primitive, the leg is primitive. The lower limb is very much like the Lucy skeleton. That was a big surprise. And in the cave where this primitive creature was found, they also uncovered stone tools, something Lucy never had. <laughs> 
people for a long time said, well, you need a big brain to make stone tools. Uh, well, okay, if Homo floresiensis is making stone tools, this creature has a brain the size of an orange. Clearly, that equation's gone. Everything about these creatures is an enigma. Where did they come from, and what were they? Some researchers have argued that Floresiensis is just a dwarfed population of modern people that suffered some kind of disease that caused them to both dwarf and have relatively small brains. But when scientists took a closer look, most saw no evidence of disease. The stone tools and the shape of the face moved the focus to our old friend, Homo erectus. Some researchers think that Homo floresiensis evolved from Homo erectus. But how did they get so small? Something called island dwarfism may be the answer. Isolated on islands with limited food, large mammals sometimes shrink over time. On Flores, there were once pygmy elephants the size of cows. Could the same evolutionary pressure have acted on Homo erectus to produce the hobbit? Or was this mysterious creature descended from an even more primitive ancestor? So perhaps we're sampling a period which is at the very beginning of the Homo lineage. So whatever the hobbit was, perhaps its ancestors were the very first wave of migration out of Africa some unknown creature, part bipedal ape like Lucy, and part Homo erectus. So if that's the case, then what we see in Indonesia makes sense. It's kind of a body that existed before human bodies became more modern. What would push such primitive creatures out of Africa? A key driving force behind the migration was probably a climate shift, which spread grasslands from Africa into Asia. And with the grasses went the game animals. Animals are gonna be moving out of Africa and the hominids will just be keeping pace with those animals. After all, that's their livelihood. Of course, our ancestors didn't know they were leaving Africa. They just followed the animals they depended on, through the Sinai up into the Middle East and beyond. It's often been called an exodus, but it really wasn't like that. When people think of exodus, they think of the Bible, or they think of migration, they think of Europeans coming over here to the New World. It probably wasn't like any historical migration, this dispersal of humans out of Africa. The process was probably very, very slow, much like the spread of any other animal species into new territories. You could imagine a group of Homo erectus moving their range a kilometer a year in one direction and doing that continually over a long enough period of time you can get the distance from Africa to Indonesia covered in say 15,000 years. By a million years ago our ancestors had populated Asia from the Caucasus to Indonesia. And they were in Europe too as a recent discovery in Spain has shown. All right, so Homo floresiensis, they, they focus in on, um, well, what, what's surprising about it is essentially the fact that it's a relatively primitive anatomy, small brain size, primitive postcranial anatomy, short, short stature, but behaving possibly in very complex ways, uh, migrating out of Africa, complex tool technologies, um, all that good stuff. So that particular fossil is sometimes nicknamed the Hobbit, um, just because of its smaller size. So here's one of those summary slides for you. We have the Hobbit, which is Homo floresiensis. Um, the site is Flores Island in Indonesia. Would have stood about three and a half feet tall in adulthood, relatively long arms and flatter feet for climbing, small dentition, flatter ornathic faces, 
and evidence for that phenomenon we call island dwarfism. So just that phenomenon that mammals that live on the island environments tend to be selected for smaller and smaller body sizes over time. So the big theory out there is that a subset of Homo erectus became isolated on Flores Island, and then over time, throughout many generations, got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, that clip also discussed the exodus out of Africa, which is it's very funny that they, you know, they use the word exodus because it's a very biblical term. Um, but um, like they said in the film, it's very likely that these hominins weren't necessarily aware of moving from continent to continent. They, of course, were aware that they were, um, you know, they're following the game routes of the, of the animals that they're hunting and they're expanding into territories that hopefully have more available resources. And as population sizes grow, it makes sense that they're not trying to all cluster in one space because if they're all trying to compete for the same resources, then it's much more likely that they're going to come into direct competition with one another, that violence will be necessary. So, you know, just like any other uh, group of organisms, they're, they're spreading out and um, locating their own territory. Okay, so um, the rising star, Homo naledi, is another one of those enigmas. So um, hopefully most of you have already watched the Dawn of Humanity documentary that was part of your homework for last week. Uh, but if you didn't get to it last week, hopefully you're going to do it either today or tomorrow, so you can still get credit for that discussion. Uh, but Homo naledi is another one of those enigmas, and this one has been a huge um, controversy in our in our in our news right now uh, because um, Homo naledi was originally discovered way back in 2013, so 10 years ago. Um, they did excavations in 2015, 2017, 2018. And they're continuing excavations in the site as we speak. Um, so this was another surprise. We have another small-brained hominin, a little bit bigger than Floresiensis, relatively small cranial capacity, anywhere from about 465 to 560 cc's. So more within the range of what you would expect with an Australopithecine. But the anatomical features of the skull, um, very slight postorbital constriction, more rounded globular cranial shape, um, you know, all the, the cranial shapes that we see are more similar to early members of genus Homo. Um, from the neck down, the postcranial anatomy is very mosaic. Um, so the shoulders, the pectoral girdle is relatively flexible and adapted for arboreal climbing. The pelvis, the innominate bones are very mosaic. So the top half looking more like a biped, bottom half looking more like a quadruped. Relatively long curved finger bones. Um, they have some have a sagittal keel, so remember that's a characteristic that we see characteristic that we see with Homo erectus. Um, relatively large double arch brow ridge, which is similar to Homo erectus. Smaller teeth and mandibles, and possibly evidence for deliberate intentional burials, which is debated. I'll talk about that here in a moment. Also, the most recent stuff that has come out, possible evidence that Homo naledi controlled fire within the rising star chamber, possible evidence that Homo naledi created art, very basic cave art etchings. And um, these, these claims, especially the fire and the cave art and the intentional burial is a little bit um, controversial because um, it was found that there's not necessarily, that some of these sites may be um, the evidence of things like carnivore activity or fluvial activity, so water wa washing these bones into these caves. Um, Lee Berger and John Hawks are the two paleoanthropologists that are leading these expeditions. There's many other paleoanthropologists involved, of course. But there's if you if you type in Homo naledi controversy into a YouTube search engine, all sorts of stuff will come up, and it'll show you um, you know the, the two main chief scientists debating this issue, and then other scientists that are not so sure that the site is um, that these these fossil remains are, are you know definitely very fascinating, and it's it's surprising that we have these small brained hominins existing this recently in time. Uh, because when they were first discovered, it was assumed like, oh, these are early genus Homo fossils. We, we expected these fossils to be dated, you know, two million years ago. 
But, you know, we find that these date to much more recently than that. And it's certainly possible that they were just around for a very long time. Maybe they did originate two and a half million years ago and they just survived until this recently. Uh, but the intentional burial debate is um, still one that's that's very active. Um, Lee Berger and colleagues think that it is evidence of intentional burial because um, you do see the very young and the very old, which is typical of a cemetery population. Uh, most of the, the remains are actually remains of children. Um, you also see that th there's also claims that there's a ritualistic pattern to the burial that um you know this that they very deliberately and intentionally would have had to have reached this cave site because there's parts of the cave that are very difficult to get to there's openings that are only about seven inches wide so when they did the original expedition way back in 2015 um, they actually hired a team of six women and they call them the underground astronauts um, and this team of six women uh, of course, are trained in paleoanthropology, but also just physically because um, they are they were small enough to get through these very small crevices and get to the actual deep in the actual cave to excavate the site. Um, now they have definitely has come into question whether or not that's the only way that they these early hominins could have gotten into that cave. That maybe there were wider openings at a period of time. Um, Lee Berger and Hawks have also presented some evidence that Homo naledi had fire pits in these caves. Uh, but unfortunately, the dates, um, the dates are not necessarily indicating that they were made by Homo naledi. The dates indicate a much more recent time frame. So it's possible that Homo sapiens made those fire pits. Or also when you're looking in that region, there's just there are a lot of wildfires. And it's possible that these charcoal remains just naturally blew into the cave. Um, the, and then the cave art debate, um, there is definitely sections within the Donaldi chamber that show um, on the cave walls, you see these scratch patterns, they almost look like hashtags. And um, I guess the, 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 the substrate of the, of the walls is made of something called dolomite. And dolomite sometimes naturally just has this kind of hashtag wear pattern. So very debated. Um, I actually, the, the documentary I assigned to you is the Dawn of Humanity do documentary, because I feel that this one um, isn't quite as fantastic in its claims, but there is a documentary called Cave of Bones that just came out in September, I believe, September of this year. And that particular documentary goes into more of the, um, you know, the Lee Berger and John Hawks um, evidence or, or what they're presenting as, as evidence for intentional burial, for cave fires, and for cave art. And also a tool in the hand of one of the child burials is what they're claiming as well. So if this topic interests you, I do highly recommend Cave of Bones as well. Uh, but just know that a lot of the claims in that documentary are very being very heatedly debated in the field of paleoanthropology at this time. Uh, but in order to understand what they're presenting, of course, you have to watch it. So if it interests you, I do definitely encourage you to watch it. And I, I have a lot of uh, resources that I've been looking at on both sides of the debate. So if it interests you, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to send that list to you as well. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts or comments on Homo Naledi? Anything that came up while you were watching your documentary last week? Nothing yet. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. Um, but I would really encourage you guys to, if you haven't already, definitely watch the Dawn of Humanity so that you can engage in discussion post number six. And then if it's something that interests you, um, definitely watch the Cave of Bones documentary. And then if you want to write something about that, if you want to write up something on the Cave of Bones documentary, like a reaction paper, um, I would be happy to give you some extra credit for that. All right, so moving on, the Denisovans. So the Denisovans uh, are believed to be closely related to both Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens, but more closely related to the Neanderthals. Um, it's really just a few teeth that we have so far for the Denisovans. Um, they were discovered in a Siberian cave site called Denisova, so that's where they get their name. Um, date range between about 48,000 to as recently as 30,000 years before present. So uh, the Denisovans likely coexisted with both Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, similar to what we see with the, when we did the Neanderthal genome study, there is evidence that Homo sapiens 
um, did in fact successfully interbreed with the Denisovans because we know that modern humans from Southeast Asian islands in Australia share as much as 6% of their genome with Denisovans. Um, also thinking way back to our human adaptation section, when we talked about the adaptations to hypoxia. So modern day human populations that have lived in the Himalayas for many generations, for example, tend to have mutations in their DNA that allow them to have more effective O2 exchange and also sometimes more effective O2 exchange between mother and fetus. So modern day Tibetans have the gene EPASI that has been also found in the Denisovan DNA. And that's a gene that helps Tibetans adapt and live more, more successfully in these hypoxic environments. So just more and more evidence that many of these species that we're looking at very possibly successfully interbred and produce viable fertile offspring. Okay, so let's talk about any questions about those enigmas about Homo floresiensis, Homo naledi, or the Denisovans. Those kind of, those ones we haven't completely figured out all the, all the ins and outs of yet. Okay, let's talk about the origins of modern Homo sapiens, the origins of modern humans. So there's going to be two what we call classic hypotheses. And then there's also a more recent one called the assimilation model. Uh, but let's first talk about the two classic ones. And this is another area of huge debate within the field of paleoanthropology. Uh, when I was an undergrad and graduate student, um, this was something that was, he was being hotly debated at both of the campuses I was on at the University of Kansas and at Cal State Northridge. Um, so it's the out of Africa model versus the multi-regional continuity model. So out of Africa model is basically stating that modern Homo sapiens evolved in Africa and then spread to Asia and Europe where modern human populations gradually replaced all the populations that they encountered. So you can think of the out of Africa model as the strict replacement model. So essentially wherever Homo sapiens migrated, um, Europe, Middle East, Eurasia, Indonesia, they eventually outcompeted, outbred, and replaced those species. So any species that Homo sapiens intercountered, um, you know, they eventually wiped them out, essentially. So you can think of the out of Africa model as basically the replacement model. Uh, the multi-regional continuity model states that the shift to modern humans took place regionally and did not involve complete replacement in all circumstances. So you can think of this one as the gene flow model or the migration model. So this one basically states that Homo erectus left Africa approximately 2 million years ago and then encountered other hominin species, new environments as they migrated outwards. So this transition to modernity and to modern Homo sapien anatomical and behavioral modernity took place regionally and did not necessarily involve complete replacement. So the multi-regional continuity model leaves a lot of room for the possibility of interbreeding, of gene migration, and you know that essentially these hominins just gradually transitioned to the more modern anatomical space, anatomical um, condition as they move from space to space, from place to place. So this, these two diagrams here just help further demonstrate, demonstrate out of Africa versus multi-regional. So this one here out of Africa showing Homo irrigaster leaving Africa approximately 1.8 million years ago. And then these offshoots here. So those that, that, that you know, subscribe to this model believe that Homo irrigaster is the African form of Homo erectus, essentially. That Homo erectus was the, uh, the European and the Asian form that eventually became an evolutionary dead end. And then Homo heidelbergensis was the common ancestor of the Neanderthals and of Homo sapiens. So we have Homo heidelbergensis in Africa, Europe, and Asia. And then, you know, the, the European and Asian forms became Homo neanderthalensis. The African forms became Homo sapiens. And then once Homo sapiens left Africa a second time, um, so Homo erectus left first and then Homo sapiens left much later on, that Homo sapiens originated in Africa, migrated outwards, and then replaced all of the hominin species that they encountered. Um, and then the multi-regional model, as you can see, you just see lots of different arrows here. So all of those arrows are just representing gene flow and migration of genes. So this one is showing that Homo erectus left Africa approximately 1.8 million years ago, migrated to other regions of the old world, such as Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. And the gene flow persisted, that this transition from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens took place regionally and did not necessarily involve complete replacement. 
Okay, so a more recent model, any questions about the two classic ones before I move on to the more recent hypotheses? Okay, so the assimilation model is, in my mind, a little bit of a compromise between the two. So it is still stating, it is still supporting that modern Homo sapiens originated in Africa. Um, however, they migrated out and interbred with other hominin species they encountered, such as the Neanderthals, and then possibly such as Homo floresiensis or Homo naledi or Homo heidelbergensis, that they didn't necessarily completely replace every species that they encountered, that they likely interbred with them, swap genes, and that those species are actually still a part of our modern day genomes. So this model certainly acknowledges and suggests that the current models that out of Africa and multi-regional models do not fully adequately explain modern human origins. And it is certainly supported by Neanderthal genome study and the fact that there were a variety of hominin species present the last 300,000 years of human evolution. So it's, you know, so studies like the Neanderthal genome study and the study on the Denisovans, uh, basically any studies uh, that we can get that involve extracting, successfully extracting DNA. Um, John Hawks and Lee Berger are definitely kind of hinting at the fact that they might be able to extract some, some protein and some DNA from some of those Homo naledi fossils, which would obviously be absolutely fascinating if they could. And if we could determine if there's any Homo naledi left in our DNA today, um, suggesting that Homo naledi could have interbred with our species. And then, of course, Neanderthal fossils, uh, many of them are recent enough that it is very possible um, to extract DNA from these fossils. So as more Neanderthal fossils become uncovered, um, you know, more Denisovan fossils, possibly more Heidelbergensis fossils, um, you know, and as DNA technologies, DNA extraction technologies become more advanced, it's certainly very possible that we will get more and more of these DNA studies that we can analyze. Uh, because these, in my mind, the assimilation model makes the most sense. It's kind of that compromise between out of Africa and multi-regional. Um, it is, in fact, still supporting that Homo sapiens originated in the continent of Africa. It's not not denying that. So it certainly is you know, similar to both models in some ways. So it is saying that, you know, Homo sapiens did in fact originate in Africa. The biggest difference is it's saying once Homo sapiens left Africa, they were able to, uh, they encountered other hominin species and successfully interbred with them. All right, so next time we're going to watch one more little clip. And this one is from the First Peoples documentary, um, episode five, Europe. And this one is going to talk about um, the Neanderthal genome studies, so that Svante Pablo did back in the 2000s. It's crazy to think that that's 20 years ago now. Um, but yeah, it's going to it's going to talk to you about Svante Pablo's study. He was actually the one of the most recent winners of the Nobel Prize the, um, due, to, due to his research on the Neanderthal genomes. So this little clip is going to talk a little bit about that, about the Neanderthal Genome Project. And also it's going to touch on a little bit of this assimilation model idea. And, you know, essentially how we could look at um, how, how Neanderthals and Homo sapiens might have interacted, because that's another one of those big questions that's still out there. You know, it's, it's likely that they did, in fact, inter encounter each other, but essentially what, what did they do once they did? Um, what does that look like, essentially? Okay, so as you're watching, um, just, you know, think of a jot down a few bits of information, because I'm going to have you guys discuss it in your breakout rooms here in a moment, but just kind of discuss some of the, uh, the implications essentially of what this study is suggesting. So it's actually rather large. It's a very pronounced. Let me, sorry, let me make sure I did the uh, optimize for sound. Hold on one second. Oh, yes, I did. Make sure the volume is up. Yes, it is. Okay, perfect doubly arched above the eye sockets. We see a very projecting nose with a very big nasal opening. Not only the face is large, but also the brain case is large. And this is because Neanderthal brains are larger than the average one of human brain. And this is perhaps surprising because Neanderthals have a bad reputation of being perhaps somehow stupid, but this is not true. This doesn't mean that they would have had the exact same cognitive properties as we do. But certainly they were uh, very similar in many respects. 
In the human family tree, Neanderthals are our closest cousins. Half a million years ago, their ancestors were the same as ours. But they moved out of Africa earlier, into Europe and Central Asia. There, they adapted to a colder climate and evolved into a different species. Not Homo sapiens like us, but Homo neanderthalensis. Neanderthals. They made Ice Age Europe their home, living in small groups, hunting big game. So what happened when modern humans turned up 40,000 years ago? What did we make of the Neanderthals? It's long been thought we were so superior, we simply wiped them out. But is this really true? The remains that Joao Zilao found in Romania tell a different story. They have the features of a modern human. The small vertical face and jutting chin that first appeared in Africa 200,000 years ago. But all is not what it seems. When you look at this skull, it is obviously modern. On the other hand, when you look more closely, some things are not quite right for a modern human. Uh, for instance, the frontal bone slopes backward uh, very markedly. The uh, dentition in particular is very strange. The first molar is smaller than the second, the second is smaller than the third. These are features that you would not expect to find in a, in a modern human. Where you do find such features is among the uh, Neanderthals. Instead of wiping out the Neanderthals, Zalao believes we mated with them. And the two peoples interbred. We call these people Neanderthal and modern human. They would not know they were Neanderthal or modern human. You have to think about what is logical in a contest like this. People have sex and people breed. It's just, uh, that's basic human nature. According to Zalao, the skull is a human hybrid, part modern, part Neanderthal. Until recently, the idea that two distinct human species could interbreed and hybridize was thought to be impossible, a scientific heresy. That's changed, thanks to DNA. Max Planck Institute is a leader in the study of ancient DNA. In 2010, they were the first people to crack the genetic code of a Neanderthal. The first challenge was to find the right bone, which still contained readable DNA after 38,000 years in a cave. Then they had to sequence the DNA, analyzing every fragment. It was like trying to read a book that's been ripped into millions of pieces.
The project was led by Swedish geneticist Svante Pabo. Imagine that what we have in this bag is the DNA we've extracted from a Neanderthal bone. And we illustrated this with an American dictionary that we have shredded. But it's not only this dictionary here, there are dictionaries of other languages that illustrate the genomes of bacteria and fungi that have lived in the bone over tens of thousands of years. And our challenge is now to try to find the pieces that come from the Neanderthal genomes among all these millions and millions of other pieces that we are not interested in. What we are faced with is not only that we have a mixture of different genomes here, the pieces are also very small and they get smaller and smaller as time passes. And not only that, they are in addition chemically modified, which we can illustrate with this. Imagine having to decipher millions of fragments that are so degraded they're barely legible. And then using them to reconstruct an entire dictionary. It seems an impossible task, but that's the equivalent of what Pabo and his team had to do with the Neanderthal genome. They had one thing going for them. Because Neanderthals are our cousins, their genome was bound to be incredibly similar to ours. Written in more or less the same language. What we'll do is compare these tiny little DNA fragments from the Neanderthal bone to the genome of present-day humans. And we expect to see just tiny differences because the Neanderthals are, of course, very closely related, after all, to present-day people, at least 10 times as close as a chimpanzee, for example. So in this analogy here, one could see this as a difference between American English and British English, for example, which is very, very similar, but have tiny little differences in how you spell words. It's these subtle discrepancies that embody the genetic difference between Neanderthals and modern humans. It took the sequencing machines two and a half years to sift and sort through all the fragments and construct a complete sequence. But when the work was done, they had before them the first genome of an extinct human. One of the first questions we were really interested in was what happened when modern humans came out of Africa and met Neanderthals. Did our ancestors then mix with Neanderthals or not? They compared the Neanderthal genome with that of modern day people from around the world. They discovered a remarkable pattern. In Africa, they found no evidence of interbreeding. But everywhere else in the world, there was a trail of Neanderthal genes. Between 1 and 3% of our DNA has been inherited from Neanderthals. I was first very skeptical when we started seeing this signal. But the power of genetics is in a way that the data will stare you in the face and force you to rethink your ideas if you're wrong. According to the genetics, interbreeding happened in the Middle East. Around 55,000 years ago, modern humans were expanding north out of Africa. At the same time, the Neanderthals were being pushed south by a cold spell in Europe. The two types of human were destined to meet. 
And here, they mated and interbred. The genetic evidence undermines the traditional view of Europe's first peoples. If they bred with each other, the two types of human cannot have been so very different. For a century and a half, scientists have been picking over the evidence in Europe, trying to understand why Neanderthals seem so separate from us. They assumed that modern humans are just superior to Neanderthals, and so there'd be no chance of them interacting with each other in any meaningful way. Now genetics is showing us that that's wrong, that these two types of humans interbred with each other. That may change everything. We've got to find a way to fit Neanderthals into this story. They're like cards from a different pack, similar but different. The problem is, if we try to put them in this structure, the whole thing may come tumbling down. To me, as an anthropologist, that's what it feels like at the moment. The old story has collapsed, and we've got to begin to tell a new story about Neanderthals and modern humans, a story about interaction. The new story starts here in southern France with a remarkable discovery which suggests modern humans were in Europe far earlier than anyone thought. This is Mandarin Cave. Archaeologist Ludovic Slimak has been excavating here for 10 years. Mandarin Cave was discovered recently and has exceptional preservation. Modern archaeological methods developed here give us a very precise picture of the lives of the different human groups who came to Mandarin Cave. As his team excavated, they uncovered a mass of artifacts in sediment that's 50,000 years old. Below the gray layer, in the middle there, you can see a kind of yellow sand. And this layer has revealed something surprising, which we've never seen in Europe before. In this one layer, were more than a thousand tiny shards of flint. This one is a perfect triangle. It's just a centimeter long. And this point has a fracture, which I think must have been caused by its use as a weapon. We know blades like this exist in traditional tribes today, but they're always propelled by a bow, which would mean that these are arrowheads. The bow and arrow is a weapon associated only with modern humans. Does this mean they were in France 50,000 years ago? 10,000 years before we find them in Romania. Slimak has to be sure the objects really are arrowheads, so he sets about replicating them. The sort of point found at Mondrian requires a very high level of skill and lots of experience to make. It's not about hitting a rock against a rock. It's about becoming in tune with that rock. There would have been only a few great craftsmen who would have been able to make them. We are going to chip off some small pieces to give the block a perfect triangular shape. 
we can then make in one go a point that's identical to the ones found in Mandarin Cave. To complete the test, he needs to fire the arrowheads and see if they fracture in the same way as the points from the cave. That requires an expert archer and a suitable prey. It's perfect. Ça vient comme ça. On a à peu près une languette de 2 de 2 mm. Fracture en plume. Oui, oui, c'est bien. C'est bien. It's a good one. That's really nice. This is exactly the kind of fracture we have in our archaeological layer, and this is really the signature of bow and arrow technology. It's fantastic. Since modern humans were the ones making arrowheads, Slimak believes they must have been here 50,000 years ago. Today, the Rhone is a major highway. Boats, trains and cars use it to get from the Mediterranean to the north. This highway must have been the same in the past. You can imagine seeing big herds of horses and bison coming up from the Mediterranean. They must have been a great resource for the hunters who were in this population 50,000 years ago. But modern humans were not the only people using this hunting ground. What's intriguing is the arrowheads were found in a layer sandwiched between other layers of artifacts made by Neanderthals. Based on fragments of soot in the same sediment, the gap between these layers was incredibly small. Analyzing this soot deposit, we can see the time between two occupations at Mandarin Cave. And therefore we know that between the people who made Neanderthal tools in this cave and the people who made the bow and arrows, it was only a very short time. Maybe one season, maybe two. The picture that emerges is of modern humans in the Rhone Valley 50,000 years ago. They show up here before anywhere else in Europe. They were using bow and arrows to hunt their prey. But they didn't stay long. For some reason, they moved on, not to return for thousands of years. And within months, or just weeks, the Neanderthals moved back in. There's no sign of confrontation. It's as if the two types of human were moving in and out of each other's territory as equals. Neanderthals. All right, we'll go ahead and stop there. I just want to show you guys a little little bit of a taste of uh, the documentary that you're going to watch for your discussion due at the end of this week. Um, we don't have time for breakout rooms today, but just a, a few announcements before we end. Let me go ahead and stop the recording here. Okay.